Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for dropping by. This is a wonderful turnout and it's wonderful to see you all. Mr. Emerger, all the way from Belgium. Mr. Patrick Scholderman, super nice to see you. My mom is here, so we must be on our best behavior. Very important. Miss Julia is here. Mr. Brian, and we have Mr. Jeremy, Mr. Chris is here, and uh, there's also one Max Metora. Thank you so much for being my channel member. And yes, I believe that um, MX940 should work with that studio. Have a go and see what happens. Wonderful to see you all. Hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Anyone else who's out there watching, lurking, totally fine, or watching the pre record, the post record, whatever it's called, the VOD, whatever you want to call it. Always nice, always wonderful to see you. Let's throw some music in the mix before we get going, uh, because I, it's, I don't really have that big a plan today. I must be super honest with you. I'm just going to have a pick of my list and we can, we can decide together what we want to talk about. Uh, this is currently a live one, Emerga. So you are one of the one of the people who's joining us live. So that's that's good. This is this is definitely a live. You can always tell in YouTube when something says live, it's live, it's live, and when it says premiere then it's a pre-record that's usually how it works so i've had a comment this morning perhaps we're going to start with that so yeah my basic overview is my list is so long it's one of those things i want to explain how you can remove filament from your draw options in in das studio if you want to do that there was a comment on the forum that people really didn't like it and i'm thinking yeah you can remove it you could just not use it that's also an option but if you don't ever want to see it again, there's an option for doing that. I picked up a funky little gadget called the Decimator and I didn't quite know how cool it actually was. So I thought I'm going to show you how it works, and how it integrates into Das Studio. Then there's a comment from Jiangjiang Zhong who said, Hey, I've watched your video about selection sets, but they don't remain invisible when I do batch render. So when the scene loads, it doesn't come out. So I want to explain that. I could talk about rigging a little cylinder, something I picked up this week. It's something that I've learned. I thought, you know, that might be nice. I don't think I'm going to go through all of this. There's also how you can bring in Unreal assets into Das Studio, should you want to do that. That's something that I've also been um, been uh, playing with. And there's one comment that uh, Michael Palmer tells me he's been trying to ask me this a few times and uh, I just uh, I just keep ignoring it or not catching it, who knows. Um, where is a place where I can post pictures for critique? And that's uh, maybe we'll start with that. Michael, that's a great question because Michael, like many of you, are, uh, are supporters of mine and uh, no matter if you support me on Twitch or here on YouTube with the join button or if you buy a membership from Patreon or if you support me through Ko-fi, you always get an invitation to the to my private Discord server, which is great, which is where we hang out. So that's one option that I'm not sure you what it looks like. So it's not a public server, not everyone can join, and uh, it's, it's kind of nice to, uh, to have that place. We're a very small crew, so it's less than 100 members there right now, and it's a very kind of exclusive club for people who are nerds like you and me, who want to just, who want to chat about things, Das Studio, and all other kinds of 3D bits and pieces, and how you get workflow done and all that. And uh, Michael was asking, hey, where is a place where I can post pictures for critique, and um, I can show you what the server looks like. We have a channel for that. It is, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's called The Lookbook. There it is. And people post bits and pieces here all the time. You can click on it. This is Chris's latest creation that he's made on a Twitch stream, by the way. This is Vintage Swimwear. I watched that stream, Chris. That was very nice. I actually clipped it up. So the whole series is now available on your Twitch channel, which is quite nice. So not nerds, geeks. That's what, that's the correct terminology. And um, if you join in, uh, Michael, you can go and post a picture in here, or you can even better, you can post one on your art station page or on your DAS gallery and then just post the link in here and ask specific questions about here what, what can I do better what can I do what have I misdone what, what do you think of this render that's a great place to to post so that is you know one thing you can do and we have all kinds of channels for all kinds of things so general chat and you know there's off-topic chat and there's game chat and there's how to do things in videos and you know people can post all kinds of stuff but the cool thing is it's basically the same vibe that we get here in the YouTube chat but without the video and throughout the week so I hang out there quite frequently I also quite frequently just don't have uh, time to hang out there at all, but I do get involved in questions and there's just a ton of people who know uh, a lot more than I do, uh, but there's also me, so yeah. 
Of course, absolutely, Chris. No problem. It's it's a wonderful piece. So I'm, I'd I'd love to have a look at it. I think there's a beta on your Discord server available, isn't there? You will make this available on your coffee store, I'm sure, as well as on your Renderosity store. Chris is modeling all kinds of stuff. Let's just have a quick look perhaps uh, on uh, Chris's Renderosity or Coffee store. Let's have a look. Coffee. Uh, and is it Chris Cox? There we go. I like that you uh, take donations this way. I'm, of course, a supporter. And you have Chris has a little shop here. If you know what Chris does, Chris does modeling in Marvelous Designer and Blender. And uh, these are some of the things he's made on stream. So that's quite cool. If you're interested in seeing how these things were done, you can watch his streams. I'm kind of his his, YouTube, his Twitch editor, so uh, Twitch deletes streams automatically after a couple of months. So I'll just make sure that they don't get removed and don't get deleted. So you know we can rewatch them because there's so much to learn. So thank you so much for sharing all that knowledge, Chris. Very nice. I might should we pop a pop a, a link into the server? Yeah, there we go. Thank you so much. That is nice of you. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, so you get this. You can also buy it from Renderosity, but from Kofi it's often cheaper because Renderosity takes a cut. Kofi does not. So support Chris directly on Kofi. There we go. Let's have a look how we can deal with selection sets and make sure they don't automatically remove themselves when you add them to a batch render. So this is a comment from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Tiang Jiang Zhong, and it's about selection sets. And he wants to, he's followed my video. I'm going to go and load my Genesis 8 figure with modesty and uh, I'll just create a quick selection set and, uh, and recap what we did there. So the problem is that when you have poke through and you're hiding geometry with the geometry editor, then sometimes what happens, I might just delete that, there we go, to see that a bit better. I'll add some clothing, like maybe the basic wear tank top here. And imagine there's an issue with poke through. So what I normally would do is I'll go and select my tank top, head over to my geometry editor tool, then use my tool settings tab and define an area that pokes through. I'm just going to define something like this, just a hole somewhere here. And once I've done that, this is a selection that is now happening on the tank top. I can go over to selection sets and right click on selection sets and then define my my own group of this selection. There's various other groups that you can define like face groups and surfaces and regions. I'm just going to use selection sets and I'll just call this one the poke section, for example. And what I can do now is I can go and open this and make this invisible. So now her skin pokes through. Usually we want to do it the other way around, don't we? <laughs> Usually want to, you want to remove things from the skin that doesn't that kind of pokes through the shirt. But the principle is the same. Sorry, I'm just I'm just making a stupid example here. So, but my point is, if I now go and save the scene, then uh, load it in again, this is visible again, and that is Chang Jiang's thing. He says, "Hey, look, uh, when I'm batch rendering." I'm adding all these things into a queue and then the queue just goes and renders this thing. So for that, I would like for the selection to remain permanently hidden and that's not possible with selection sets. So instead what we can do, and this is a bit of a more final step, we can remove that geometry completely from the model. Notice there's no undo for that, but it is possible to do that. So how you do it is uh, you go to your selection set and you just say, click the plus icon, which adds it as an active selection. So this now is as if you had just selected something like that. This is just, you know, you click the plus icon and then this gets selected together with whatever was selected before. You can also unselect that by uh, right clicking geometry selection, clear selection, that'll clear everything up again. But if we wanted to make this permanently invisible, let's click the plus icon to activate it and then left click, uh, sorry, right click on the selection and then under geometry editing, you can say, whoops, geometry editing, you can say delete selected polygons. And that's kind of, it's one of those things. If you, when you do that, then Das Studio pops up a dialogue that says, hey, you're about to delete 134 polygons and any internal vertices um, from the base geometry. 
this cannot be undone so it's a bit of a final step but if you do that then there's literally a permanent hole notice that the selection set itself has gone away because it no longer references these vertices they're now then are completely gone and as a result if you go and save this scene and i might as well demonstrate that while i'm here i'll go put it on the desktop and i'll call it test scene give it a minute and uh, now I'm going to go and maybe uh, open this again, open recent testing. Then uh, you won't even see a difference, but <laughs> the, the, what will happen is that this hole is going to remain there. And you will never be able to bring these vertices back because they're removed for good. But it's kind of one of those things, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, exactly safe before you do that. This is why I'm a big fan of selection sets, because they can be undone. If you do need that, uh, that section in your in your geometry again you can always go and bring it back but if you ever wanted to make this permanently basically permanently disable this this is how you can do it there big hole in there so i've done it the other way the wrong way around i should have really made the selection set on the figure but i didn't have any pokes through so this is just easier to demonstrate the principle is the same and i hope Tianjiang, that helps there we go mouse agrees that has helped Tianjiang out i hope so i hope it does some people were on uh, some people are frequently concerned about filament and why if they especially if they can't use it on their hardware if their hardware doesn't support it and it still shows up as an option here is there a way to to permanently remove it and uh, yes there is there is a way to get rid of this option completely and uh, i i like filament i do enjoy it but i understand you know we're all individuals and some of us uh, just don't want to see it i mean rather than not using it is there a way to whittle this down and yes there is and um, this is a tip actually from matt from thundon games very good channel you should check it out it's it has a lot of das tips he's posted that about a year or so ago uh, filament is implemented like many other things in das studio as as a plugin and as such you can go and disable a plugin and remove it if you don't want to see it again and the way to do this is under the help section with help about install plugins this appears maybe just to be a menu of things that are just you know information but it isn't actually if you click on it then you should see a massive list of any plugin that's available so even some things that are enabled that you use on a daily basis are also implemented as a plugin and as such you can disable it so anything that has a yellow tick is something that's a plugin so like the decimator that i'm going to show you in a minute that is a plugin and when i install it it just automatically enables itself and filament is one such thing so filament draw style is in fact implemented as a plugin so lo and behold if you disable that here and then just hit ok you're gonna have to restart das studio for that change to take effect but let's just do that i don't want to save this that's cool as soon as you bring it back i'll reopen it again whenever das studio is ready which might not be immediately <laughs> so give it a second but when you can start it up again filament is going to be totally gone do you know this is exactly what i was thinking patrick why would anyone want to remove it but this is i've heard this question time and time again of um uh, disgruntled people who are kind of happy with das studio but they're also unhappy with it and they're not afraid to voice their opinion so um yeah some people just want to get rid of it so i can see it on systems like my mac mini for example who on which it is technically enabled but the gpu isn't capable of using it because it's a, it's a it doesn't support opengl whatever it is that what it whatever it needs um so on my mac i can select it but it doesn't work and i think that's kind of a problem so to avoid crashes and to avoid confusion you can just go and remove it so this is how it works you can do the same with all kinds of other things including nvidia iray or including some of the content creation tools um you know you can totally remove that and then it's just out of your sight out of your mind so this is a way to do it i'm gonna go and bring it back actually because i do need it <laughs> or i actually like it so help about install plugins this is also how you add serial numbers to your bits and pieces so like face transfer if you buy the full version and you need it and you have a serial number for face transfer this is where you put that in somebody was asking me recently how do i enable uh, anilib and i don't use anilib but anilib is implemented like that anilib is a very small script or a very very small piece of code and then um, 
you get a serial number that's on your serial numbers tab. You copy that, paste that into Death Studio, restart Death Studio, and that is how that works. Yes, that's also an option, Chris. You want to minimize clutter. That's true. Yes, also true, Patrick. That would be nice if they if something would just be disabled by default if, if something doesn't work. Yeah, like on my Mac, I can select it, but it just doesn't it just doesn't really work. So yeah, one of those things. <laughs> we'll see how Death Studio 5 will fare. That is in development. There we go, we're back. That's quite nice. And from what I understand, it is only about um what's it called? It is just it's just an update that lets Mac users with Big Sur and hopefully above use Das Studio again. So currently they can't do that. Das Studio 4 doesn't support that. But maybe with Das Studio 5, that's the plan, they will again. From what I understand, nothing is going to change majorly. All functionality is going to stay intact or will become available at one point. We'll see. I'm excited to have a look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to checking it out. Remove filament. While we're talking about it and plugins and all that, let me show you the decimator. I don't know if you've heard of the decimator, but um, let's just go and bring it up. Oh, actually, I can go to wpguru.tv or .co.uk forward slash DAS. That'll bring me to the latest releases of the DAS store. And also, if you go shopping via that link, I get a cut of every purchase you make. That'll support me and greatly help me out because it'll, you know, pay my rent, which is awesome. So. <laughs> Hectics, how you doing? Good to see you. So um, on this page, I just wanted to show you this because it is hilarious. It makes me laugh. I am now available as a product on the Dash store. Look at this. Javis Lewis is now available to purchase. Only for limited time, mind, because uh, this is part of the new season pass that is coming out at the beginning of, well, it's available to purchase now and we'll do, as part of this, I will do three live streams on the, uh, on the, I'm, we're not entirely sure where yet, but it'll be for those people who've purchased. It could be on the YouTube channel as a, as a private thing, could be on a different service. We're, we're still debating options there, but yeah, you can now purchase me on the Dash store and this is available in two, whoops, that didn't work, did it? Oh, they forgot the link. I will tell Travis. <laughs> <laughs> this needs to be das3d.com forward slash and then that'll work it is new <laughs> it is very new <laughs> yes look at that big smile exactly there we go so you can't purchase me uh, that'll get you access to just the to just the live streams but not the content but you can also uh, pick up another product it is funny isn't it i, I didn't know that we we're going to do that so it's, it's it was a total surprise when i saw that the other one is the full season pass, which also gives you access to content. Does that work? Yeah, that works. And look at the amazing work that they've done there. Wafty flag. Those of us who've used DeForce before will totally see. Yep, absolutely DeForce at work. There's also, as you scroll this, there's water splashes on the screen. So that's kind of cool. And this is wafting in the sea because the theme is pirates. And uh, what's going to happen is there'll be um, no interactive licenses included, I'm afraid, Jeremy. But you get this at Platinum Club members get this for $99. Non-Platinum Club members get the whole package for $125. And if you don't want to buy the content and just watch the webinars with me, then you can get it for 60 bucks. And the idea is that uh, it'll be a three-part series about... Um, well, it tells you down here what we're discussing. Uh, we're going to set up a scene, but over three episodes. So I'll talk a little bit about content saving and how you can go and uh, make sure you can save poses beforehand, save them to your library, bring them out again, how you get organized about the content. Then we'll talk a lot about posing, the posing tools. That's something that I've been meaning to talk about for a while. So we'll spend a whole two hours on that, including questions. And then on the third part, we're going to bring those two things together and build a whole scene with the content that is available to choose from here. So it's going to be a pirate scene it's gonna be an outdoor theme and people have found a treasure chest and they want to want to share the share the loot that sort of thing that is what I get that's I just you know while I was on the front page I was gonna show you that because that's just that's just cool so yes if you if you do want to join me there it'll be great it'd be great to see you
Ah, Randy, good morning. And Dilich, good morning. Uh, or good afternoon, or good evening even. Uh, Randy, good question. Could you speed up Dash 3D rendering by having a magical button that would have the graphic card stop updating the normal window screen and therefore use all its power on the rendering? That magic button is, I'm afraid, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. It's basically when you're when you're here and you're about to render, click that button, right? Before you do that, just disable the viewport automatically without having to do that, right? Currently, you have to do it manually. That is a great idea for a script, though. I wonder if that is if that is doable. It should really be fairly easy to program, even if you don't um, do it via this button, if you can't hook it in via that. It should be possible to create a script that says, no matter what's happening in the viewport, switch this to texture shaded or to uh, filament, then start the render. That should be possible. I'm not good enough at scripting, but I will bring it up with some of my scripting buddies. Maybe they can make it happen, Randy. Good, good tip, good, good tip. Dilich, yes, it's wonderful. I have one that's currently used as to stream this signal. So I have two RTX 2080s in this computer here, but I have one RTX 3060 that is in my streaming PC that is currently transcoding the signal. And I'm sometimes using it as a random node. And I can tell you the 3060 is exactly, is as fast as the 2080, but it just has more RAM. And hopefully at one point it'll be cheaper. So yes, it's a good card to get. It's, list price is about 350 bucks, don't get the TI version. The TI version has less RAM and it's slightly faster, but for our 3D purposes, it's, it's not a good idea. Uh, get, get the regular 3060, it's a little cheaper. It's a tiny bit slower for games, so we're talking 5%, but it has the 12 gigabytes of RAM, which will certainly come in handy. So there we go. <laughs> I, I will, I'll ask, I'll ask. I'm not sure if Daz are gonna do it, but I'm sure that a scripting buddy of mine could maybe integrate it. I'll, I'll let you know, Randy. Keep watching, if it is available, I will totally let you know. Let's talk about the Decimator. This is a product here, it's available for $100 list price. Whew, that is, um, you know, a lot. And I've seen it fairly often and I thought, I'm not sure, I'm sure the, that other programs can do decimation better than the script could do it. And so hence I held off buying it for quite a while. And it turns out after Jeremy told me, hey, um, it is actually much cooler than you think. He showed me some screenshots of the installation that he has going. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. I appreciate that. And then I understood, hey, this thing is actually much cooler than just getting rid of Polygon. So this is not the only thing that Decimator does. And I wanna show you how it works because this is one of those tools that you think, man, I had no idea it was gonna be that good. And it's literally, if you're staying inside Das Studio. Uh, so let me show you how it works. It's a very short thing once you've installed it. It's like 200 kilobytes or something. And once it's in there, I'll go and bring in my uh, modesty texture clothed Genesis 8 figure. Darrell and I have been working on a product that gives you stream safe textures. And hopefully this is gonna be available to purchase very soon. I'm working on making that happen. It's essentially the Genesis 8 base figure, but she's not naked and therefore I can use her on YouTube, which is awesome. Exactly what I want. So this is my, this is a regular Genesis 8 figure. And let's have a quick look at the wire texture shaded view, just to see the amount of polygons that are on there. So wire texture shaded shows you, if I zoom in here, not only the base, whoops, sorry, <laughs> the base geometry, that's this one here, that's the kind of the larger, the thicker squares. It also shows you the applied subdivision surface modifier, about which I've talked extensively in a previous video. So these little thin gray lines here, that's the implied subdivision surface modifier. So if I go over to the parameters tab and go on the mesh resolution, I have these two options here. I've got base and I've got high resolution. And if I switch this to base, you can see that the subdivision surface modifier is kind of disabled and I only am left with these squares here. And this is a really handy thing to do, to switch to base resolution while you're doing something that is intense. So anything from posing characters, animating characters specifically, if you're changing several dials on the character, like the pose architect is a great example. Maybe I can show you the, the effect here. Under parameters, under pose controls, and uh, pose architect. So if I go and say, I don't know, say the natural uh, pose, 
might as well change to this thing. If I go and uh, move this, you can see that my computer is kind of struggling a little bit because there's a lot of polygons that are being shifted around. It's not, it's not moving smooth at all. And this is in base resolution. So if I go and uh, change this back to my, uh, to my high resolution, it's gonna be even worse when I do that. It's it's uh, depending on if you have clothing on the on the character and if you have all kinds of other things on the character. Uh, it's the polygon count and the calculations that need to be applied on the polygons that really is sometimes killing the system. And this is where decimator can really come in handy. So I've got it tagged and uh, tapped here on the right hand side. It's a small tab. You get it by heading over to window panes and you get your decimator once it's installed you get that out and the way this works is on the selected object which is my genesis figure on the selected object i can go and click this button which is, says prepare to decimate and that's quite cool if i do that then it takes a second and all of a sudden uh, polygons are changing in my figure granted they, this this calculation could probably be done better but look at all the options that i have now i can create i can do something with my resolution i can either drag that down 100 percent means the base resolution is now uh, being used for the for this calculation if i drag this down to say 50 percent then i can see that my polygons here update on the fly reducing my character down until you know she becomes uh, almost unnoticeably uh, creepy so it's you know it goes into this walking zombie territory but of course look at the polygons there's so there's so much less for my computer to move around now so if I do that to something like maybe 20% or so then I can go and move my sliders here a lot faster and if you have a lot of clothing on your character or you have hair and stuff and there's just a lot of stuff your computer needs to calculate especially on older laptops um, then you know that's that's just a wonderful way to do that and the way this works is it doesn't actually ruin your geometry full stop it all it does and this is why i find this is such a beautiful way how the way it's implemented under your mesh resolution it just now goes and gives you another level of another resolution level basically a level of detail so that is how it works it's kind of nice i can still go and switch back to my high resolution if i wanted to and then all my high-res polygons come back or i can switch to base resolution or i can switch to my decimator working resolution and this is kind of nice so you can dial this in then pose your characters animate your characters see a very fluid preview and then once you're happy to render you just go and switch this over and back into the into the high resolution so i thought that was the missing piece of information that i didn't have that's kind of nice you can also export the character at this resolution so much like exporting a character at base resolution if you just switch it to decimator working then it'll be whatever resolution is dialed in here that's kind of cool um, but you can you can do other things. So uh, there's the first of all. Let me just go back to these options here. If you if you you can dial in a particular resolution percentage. So if you say I want my my character to be 50% of the resolution that it currently has, you can type that in. Or if you say I would like my character to be, I don't know exactly 5,000 polygons. Or maybe your game engine or your project has something that says I mustn't exceed X amount of polygons for the main character. You can type that in here. So I can say 5,000. Uh, polygons resolution level and if you do that then it just works out whatever that is and then adjusts the polygons automatically so that is very very cool very nice you can also anything that's parented to the character like clothing is also automatically adjusted there's also weights that will be adjusted along with it that's also quite nice you can also add your own levels of detail to the resolution level menu so currently this says decimator working i can also go and say uh if i say create lod then it would say with with say with 20 percent I'll, I'll put this to 20 percent it doesn't make it look quite as terrible if i say create lod it says what do you want to call that perhaps lod 6687 isn't exactly something that i can remember so i'll go and say this is now 50 percent resolution and when I do that, I get this extra option here. So now it doesn't say decimator working anymore. It says 50%. So this is now locked in. I can go back to base still, and I can go back to high res if I wanted to do that. 
but I can now also go to 50% resolution. So that lets me make several levels of detail. If I needed three or four for my game project, then I can do that. Quite exciting. I don't know how this works with Unreal Engine, but it's kind of an interesting thing to figure it out. I wonder if it's uh, if when I use the Send to Unreal Engine, if that is actually gonna if that's gonna take that into consideration. I wonder. Yeah, it's $100, but you frequently get this at, you know, 50 to 80% off. So pop it on your wish list and the back burner and, you know, just uh, keep it around the... At least you now know what it does. So this is something that I never... Um, thought I didn't know this the plugin would work that way I had always assumed well it'll reduce my polygons but what's how is that going to help me inside that studio if I'm doing an animation or whatever this is how it helps so it leaves the rigging and the surfaces and all the weight maps intact while you work on something so it can provide you with a much more fluid viewport experience so especially animators uh, will be able to benefit from that so it's one of those things I, I had a client Jeff it's it's a shame I didn't know this at the time otherwise I would have recommended you buy this Jeff uh, he was um, animating several characters in a race walk animation looked very very good he will share this at one point and he's a race walking judge and he is he wanted to make training sessions and hence he wanted to build an interactive scene with several race walkers who then cross the finish line and um, show to his students uh, who who take the course show to his students well this is what you're going to have to look at and he wanted to use das figures to make that happen and one of the things i remember we were talking about is that even at base resolution uh, several characters they are very difficult to move so if you drop them down in resolution that would have greatly helped so you know i hope you can make use of this if you're watching jeff awesome to see that final product by the way very good very good the mouse is here of course yes modern engines do that that's true but if you don't take the character out into a game engine it's kind of nice to have this functionality inside that studio so ha 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 Yes, it's an absolute, it was a real eye-opener. So the next thing on my list of things to buy is, oh, Jeremy, help me out here. What was it again? Was it the Alembic Exporter? I haven't bought that yet because it's not on sale at the moment. Alembic Exporter for Das Studio. So that might also come in handy. Jeremy has it. It's on 90 bucks, so it's another one of those expensive plugins. But this is really, um, this is this is exciting. I can't wait to try that out and see how Alembic fares if I transfer characters elsewhere on something that, you know, does maybe where FBX isn't isn't such a good option. Another thing to to put on your wish list, yeah. Decimator and the Alembic exporter, but I haven't explored this yet, so I will do that as soon as I, you know, as soon as I get a bit of a sale gig going there. Yes, the decimator. Oh yeah, if you wanted to add another level of resolution here, you have to go and say prepare to decimate again. I think it does this from the regular resolution. So just with the selected object, prepare to decimate, and then it starts again uh, at this level. This is now you have decimator working as well as 50%. So now you can go and create your next LOD uh, with something else. You can make that, I don't know, 50%. Create LOD, and then you go and say call it 50 uh, what did I what did I call it? Fifty percent. I said percent percent. That's that's funny, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, there we go. So now we have fifty. Oh, we have fifty and resolution. Ah, oh, dang. <laughs> How do I get rid of it? I don't know. Just not select it, I guess. <laughs> I meant to put something else, but the, the 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 what I was trying to show you is now you have multiple levels of of LODs there. Mirror the decimator operation. What do you mean, Tizalicious? Mr. Nate, good morning, by the way. Mirror as in from one, like poses, you mean, from one side of the body to the other? Is that what you mean? Interesting question. We've gone through that. Geometry, no, it's not really made for creating, it's not really meant for modeling. I mean, you can, there's other tools uh, for that. Let me see, let me just go work at 50% resolution here. And with the decimator kind of in place, I'll just go switch over to filament to have a much lesser resolution figure. I mean, it's at 50%, it's not actually that bad. 
I must say, I mean, for, for renders in which the character isn't featured 4K, it's not actually, it's not actually that bad. And that's, of course, because the textures are still, um, are still pretty much the same. There is something I can maybe show you with that. If I go and grab a pose here for her, that'll work. Something, anything, any pose that'll work. Any, maybe an adventure pose. Let's do, let's use that. Like say, say something that's, that's very definite left and right. Let's say maybe, maybe this one here. There. So if you wanted to mirror this, there is a tool, it's a 3D Universe tool that does that. It's, it's the Scene Tool Set 3. I have it at the top here, and that lets you literally just go and mirror multiple types of the body. So the first one here, this first icon, that will just go and mirror everything from one side to the other. And that's that's that. So including um, expressions, literally the, the first icon does everything. So from one side to the other, including rotation. So that is something that you can use to mirror at least the pose. But uh, mirroring the geometry, that is, uh, that's kind of something else. I've talked about this in another video um, in which you can literally uh, invert houses. You basically have to go and invert, the, in our case, the, the x-axis. So I don't know if the character lets you do this, uh, but that would be, that's another uh, possibility but mirroring poses that's actually fairly easy what you have to do yeah a character doesn't let me do it because they've disabled the scale on the character have they i think so yeah it's just translate and rotate i don't have the scale on the character but I've exp there's a video on my channel that will that will show you if you had a more simple geometry like a building that has a chimney on the left and you wanted that building to have a chimney on the right instead it's a fairly complex process but you can do it you just invert one of the axes and uh, then you have to also invert the uv maps or the, the textures rather and um, otherwise writing will be mirrored image but it, it's possible there's a there's a um, video on my channel on that Mom says hi too. That's awesome. Hello, D Dragonate's mom. Good to see you. I'm glad you're watching. Good to see you. <laughs> what else is on my long list of things that I could show you how to rig a cylinder? I've just learned that this week. The literally just the basics. I've been getting a lot of questions about rigging, and it's really really difficult to do. So maybe we can go. Um, we can go through that. See if I can remember it. That's that's another thing. Shall we do that? That's cool. There are mirror geometry products for G3 and G8, right? Yeah, I suppose. Oh, that's that's good to know. Drop a link in the in the chat if you if you have one. Let me see if I can show you this. This is really just the basics of of rigging. It's taken me years to understand that. Let's see if I can if I have something like this little guy. I can show you uh, the final product. Uh, I'll give them a a color first of all. White isn't a good color for you, buddy. Come on, let's make you let's make you green, maybe a darker type green. Yeah, let's do that. And you're also glossy. I'm I'm okay with the glossiness. That's cool. So I've made this guy that he can go and bend into little directions here, and that that's just, for me that's huge because for years I've been thinking, how do they do it? How do they rig things? I don't really never got the concept, um, but I think I'm beginning to see how this all works and. Um, just before I forget this usually what I do is I write an article about this so I've written everything down but it's nice to repeat that and if you want to learn alongside with me maybe you can you can reap the benefits uh, I'll talk about weight maps a little bit how you can make that a bit smoother here and then of course on top of that we could also go and create ourselves a smoother not a smoothing modifier as well as a subdivision surface modifier let's just put both of these things on and see what it looks like so convert to sub d first of all that makes this a bit smaller a bit smoother this is still falling in on itself so let's go and see if the smoothing modifier will help us there add smoothing modifier a little bit but most importantly the weight maps are gonna are gonna help us make this a bit smoother so that the geometry doesn't collapse in on itself so let me create this guy from scratch. The mouse, uh, it was rigged already, so I used the existing rig for that. 
uh, I just applied a Mixamo animation to the existing rig. So the mouse character was was quite nice in that you could upload him to uh, Mixamo and then download the animation from Mixamo. Mixamo, by the way, I don't know if you've seen this, but they've changed their layout again. So now I think the option to bring out an animation that you can apply in Dash Studio, I don't think that longer exists, which is such a shame. One of those things. To the dark side of rigging. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we have cookies and weight maps. Absolutely. And it is the dark side of rigging. I totally, I, I totally appreciate that. But so in Dash Studio, there's, there's various types of rigging. So the one I'm using is the one for the, with the figure setup tab. Let me show you what I've learned. I'm going to make myself a primitive, which is a cylinder with these proportions here. It'll be 1.5 meters tall and 50 centimeters in diameter and it'll have 12 segments and 12 sides and I'm doing that so that the polygons are fairly squared out. Usually you would build geometry like that in a different program like Blender or the ZBrush or wherever you build your 3D geometry. You usually do not use Dash Studio for that but that's quite okay. I'm gonna go and change over to my wire texture shader view just so that I can see the geometry here. This is what this thing looks like. But in the scene tab, uh, I can see it's just a cylinder and it's just an object. So it currently doesn't have that hierarchy going that we can expand like the top, middle and bottom that we had before. So for that, in, in all types of rigging, software that I've seen usually if it's not automatic rigging it, like where you put points and it just infers things like a humanoid IK rig or something if if it's a standard object you want to rig anything from a, a simple door to something like the hood of a car to a proper character you have to place bones in the figure and then you have to associate that with the face groups that are supposed to be uh, changed by those bones and then you add weight maps to make that bend more or less or you know make it look ugly less more or less ugly so um that's what that's what rigging does in principle and you can use this approach in Dash studio as well but there's an easier way to do this and it took me literally years to understand why that is there's a thing called the figure setup tab and let's bring it up window panes figure setup this is it and if you drag that out, that's kind of a largish tab. I'll go and put that on my right hand side here. It is, it, you know, it wants to be fairly large here and it has a kind of interesting options. We need that in order to import an OBJ into here and then drag that over to this side and then create our bone hierarchy from the face groups. So it's kind of weird to think that you have to have the face groups first and then Dash Studio will work out where the bones will go from there. Um, as I said, there's a way to just put the bones and then associate face groups, but it turns out that's actually more cumbersome to, to, use, the, to use the surface um, sets. So let's create some using the geometry editor that we had before with the tool settings open. I'm gonna go and define some face groups. This is called different things by different programs. So in uh, in Blender, for example, you have, you, they're called vertex groups. ZBrush calls them poly groups. So this is, sorry, just in case I, I wasn't quite clear what I was doing here. I'm selecting geometry with the uh, paintbrush tool, essentially. So left click and drag some of the polygons that you like and you can then hold control and then just add other polygons to it but that'll be very cumbersome so there's also little little helpers that that can that can make that for you so this is kind of the the, the most tedious part of, of rigging i guess of set up the the face groups so there's once you've done that you can just define the top face and then when you say when you right click on the selection you can go and uh the geometry selection there we go there's something called grow selection that's control and the plus key together uh, so in, in reality it's control shift and plus to get the plus to acknowledge that so you can do that and then it'll essentially just grow whatever the selection currently has so i'm going to grow that to four faces down and that will now be my top group and I'll define that as a face group over here. So much like we've defined selection sets earlier, I'm going to define face groups here. 
these are them. So you have the default is everything. That's kind of the, the whole, you can define a surface, a region, and a selection set, as well as a face group. So I'm gonna go and right click on the face groups and say, create face group from selected. So that's totally what I'm gonna do. And that's, I'm gonna call that uh, top because that's what it is. And now I have two here, default and top. We'll talk about default in a minute. I'll go and do the same thing on the bottom. So select all the bottom faces, then hit Control, Shift and plus, and just go make myself a selection that encompass, en encompasses all of that. And I'll go and do the same thing again. Click face groups, right click, create face group from selected, and I'll call that one bottom. And now the cool thing is because we had one surface that was called default, that is essentially whatever is left over. So this is the middle part that I can use. I don't have to recreate it. I can just go and rename it. So double click and I'll call that middle. So now I can either go and select bits and pieces from here, or I can make things visible or invisible. So that's, you know, that's, that's those are the, the surface groups defined. And I suppose at this point, let me go and save this out so that I don't lose anything that I've made here. On my desktop, maybe I'll go and make a folder and I'll call that Rigging Adventure. And because this is all simple geometry, I'll be able to share all these files with you later. I might do that. I might put that on my Patreon page so you can all have a look at this. I'll call this one, what shall we call it? Uh, Cylinder V1, how about that? Cylinder V1, that's a, that's a great title. So this just saves my DAS scene. This hasn't really done anything in regards to rigging yet because for that, for the figure setup tab, I need an OBJ. So in addition to that, I might go and select my cylinder object and I'll go and say file export and I'll put that on in the same folder namely uh, rigging adventure i'll make maybe a, a subfolder in there that's called obj's in that i'll select wavefront obj and i'll call that uh, cylinder with groups maybe with groups just so that i remember what that is that is just the plain obj i'll use the dash studio preset for that boom that's it Technically, I can now go and remove my current cylinder uh, from here. I don't need to see it anymore, so I'll go and get rid of it because it's done its job. Now we're going to go and play with this scary thing called the figure setup tab. And so in here, on this right hand side under geometry, I can go and right click and say add geometry. So this is now something in which I need to go and bring in my OBJ. Let's do that. That is over on my desktop again, some squares. Where's the desktop? Desktop, right there we go. Rigging adventure and in OBJs, oh, there's a cylinder with groups. So the one that I've just made. And it comes up with the standard import, whoops, standard import dialog. Hello, come over here. And I'll just use the Dash Studio um, preset here, just so then the scale and everything else is correct. So I'll go on import that and now I have my cylinder here I can open it up and I can see the groups that I had defined bottom middle and top and that's kind of cool but on the right hand side here this is really where the whole magic is gonna happen so I'll go and grab my geometry from here and then I go and left click and drag it out and then I'll go and move that over to where it says geometry here so I'll just go left click and drag and just drop it on here. And then this happens, which is, you know, also kind of weird and scary, but you know, we're, we're getting there. This is now, this is now creating the bones that are inferred or that are being yeah, inferred basically from the face groups here. So these are the bones and the bones associate with a face group. That's how this works. So the bones, I can go and close them down if I wanted to do that. I can go and drag them into a hierarchy now. So in my case, I'd like the bottom to be the root node. On a character, it would be the hip, or you know, on a tail, it'd be something else. What well, depends on your object. So I'm gonna use the bottom as my root geometry from which all the other pieces go and start happening. So I'm gonna drag the middle onto the bottom 
So left click and drag the bone onto the bone, not the surface. And then we have this. So now the middle bone is parented to the bottom bone. And I'm gonna go and take the top bone and parent that to the middle bone. And that creates my hierarchy now. That's that's kind of cool, isn't it? That is pretty neat. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's interesting because the the groups that I've defined are now associated with the bones already. So usually I think the difficult part in rigging is that you have to do this afterwards. So it's kind of, you know, like there's so much more to explore. So, so once I've done that, once I've got my hierarchy set up, I need to make sure that this value here, the bone rotation order is set. That's another difficult thing for, for me to comprehend. I mean, I've read this article on the DAS website about how to get started with rigging. Um, I've read that so many times that it just took me forever to understand that here, this is it. I might post that in the, in the chat. This is basically all the articles they have on rigging and they are correct, but you only understand that if you already know how to do it. It's not really a great way of teaching you how to do it. So that's that's a bit of a downfall. If you know exactly what's going on, you can go and um, you can understand it. But if you don't, then you know, you're, you're lost. I'll post that. <laughs> I, I know, Patrick, did you know, by the way, that there is integrated documentation inside DAS Studio? Did you know that? Patrick, I'm gonna show you this. It's uh, it's under, it's not actually so much under this, this is a user guide under help. So that actually gets you a user guide, but there's something else. You can go under window, panes, there's a help pane. Did you know that? Patrick, and this has literally links to the documentation, quick start guide. There's a PDF here. There's also, whoops, there's also um, uh, videos. The user guide, there is documentation. Did you know? We should read it. It, it is hidden. It is definitely hidden, but if you're looking for written instructions, they are actually there. Same with the quick start guide and quick start videos. And maybe that needs a refresh in DAS Studio 5. We'll see what we can do. Yes, it's crazy, isn't it, uh, Jeremy? One of those things. Anyway, so I've got, so bone rotation. X, Y, Z, you can change these things from X, Y, Z to X, Z, Y, Y, X, Z, Y, Z, X, X, Z, Z, X, Y and Z, Y, X. And you think, I don't know what it means. Somebody tell me how to do it. It's, it's tricky. The first letter, this is how I remember it. The first letter is the axis along which your bone will present itself. So in my case, I have a standing up cylinder. So that means it'll be the Y axis. This is, this is how I can remember. It's actually very easy, but it, was, it, it wasn't obvious to me for many, many years. So my cylinder will have to have a bone rotation of YXZ or YZX. I still don't know which one, but it's going to be one of those. Like standing up cylinder, like a, the leg of a human being uh, or the leg of a, of a critter creature type thing, that would have a rotation order that starts with a Y. Then something like a tail that goes horizontally, that would be, depends on how your character stands. Uh, an arm would be the Z axis. If you look at the front of the character, front's kind of X and then the sides would be Z. So the arms would start with Z, but a tail that would go to the back, that would be, the X would be the first letter of that. So that's how you can remember the bone rotation or that's how you can at least think about the bone rotation. My cylinder will have to start with Y. Then the next two letters, like the in my case here, Y, X, Z, the, the second letter is going to be the axis that is least likely to rotate to 90 degrees. Still got a little bit of a problem with that. Whereas the third letter is going to be the axis of your bone that is most likely to rotate 90 degrees. One of those things, I think in my cylinder, that'll that'll bend uh, basically just, just like that and go, go wiggle like that. I think it doesn't really matter. I don't think it, will it rotate around the Y? Or will it, sorry, will it rotate around the, um, will it, it'll rotate like this and like that. So I don't think it matters in my case, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what they say it does. So I'm gonna use Y, X, Z for my little example here, but I need to set up all my bones. So you can either go do this bone by bone or you can multi-select all of these and then set all of them up to the same rotation. So I'm gonna do that, Y, X, Z. There we go. Uh, that is that.
while we're on this menu, once we've done that, uh, super important, we need to also go and set up basic maps for that. And that happens under here. Select weight maps. So all bones, select all bones, then go and select weight maps. And that'll bring up this little dialogue here. That'll tell you, well, you can generate maps for everything or you can take things out if you want. So I might, uh, I might just take the bulges out because I'm not, I'm not bulging anything right now. And I'm just going to use the twist X, Y, and Z. Scale, I don't think I need scale either, so I'm just going to use the twist axis. I don't need the, the map for scaling uh, for scaling right now, so I'm just going to have to do this. Hey, sit, hit, accept. And I think that is almost it. Bear with me here. I think that is almost it. So if I go and um, create my figure now, I might, I might just actually just go and save this again. And save this as cylinder v2 because whatever's on the figure setup tab will be saved with the scene but we don't have an object in our scene yet so i think if i do that if i if i go and hit that big blue button now that says create that will create my object you can apply a sub d automatically if you want to do that i think maybe we won't do that so that we just see the geometry and say boom so now we have the same cylinder in our scene that we had before and it doesn't really appear to be that much difference except for on the scene tab where we now see that this guy now has sections it has the top node just like a character top node then it has the bottom the middle and the top bones and i can select them with my regular 3d manipulator just by clicking on the object so that's quite nice that's almost like you know part one of the puzzle done i'll go and save another version of this in fact i'm going to go and close the figure setup tab uh, maybe later maybe later i'll go and save this as another version so that you guys can follow along there so cylinder v3 righty but the problem is if i go and try and wiggle this around the x-axis nothing appears to happen at the moment and that's because i think i need to associate well i need to i think i need to fill my map so i need to tell my maps which bones to look at and that happens i think don't quote me on it i think it happens with the weight map brush tool that's this guy here weight map brush tool you can also get it from the tool section this guy node weight map brush and it now presents me with maps per portion of my object so I, this is this is really tricky concept to grasp so i've got the bottom middle and the top and if i were to go and select the top you can see that on the bottom it, this this whole thing has changed to red which is kind of interesting uh, whereas when i change this to top it's it's there's nothing there so it, that appears to me as if the z rotation map for bottom is painted a hundred percent but the z rotation map for top isn't painted on at all so that's interesting same for middle so bottom has all the maps including y and x rotation so these are all three different maps here it's a very difficult concept to grasp but, but we have three maps and they can be filled out depending which portion of the object they need to go and influence so let's make that happen thanks epic that's good to know so to uh to fill them i'll go and select my top object here then right click with my map brush tool onto the object and there's this thing here weight editing that says fill selected smooth selected attenuate selected fill by bone selection groups and i think that is the kind of the key if i click that it will fill the top middle and bottom maps depending on where the bones are so the bones we haven't looked at the bones yet we'll do that in a second uh, i'll go and do this now and check my bottom map that is only filled at the bottom now whereas the middle is now painted where that bone is and the top is painted where that bone is so this is nice the way of it automatically distributing where the weights kind of need to be and um, bones is something as i said we haven't looked at yet these are just the nodes technically but the bone tool that is uh, this guy here that's the joint editor tool that's another guy that you can select and if you uh, click on him that's also under tools joint editor if you click on him then you see that this this is where das studio has made the made the three bones here it's top bone middle bone and the bottom bone and you can now go ahead and change the center point or the end point here into positions where they need to be so if you have 
uh, geometry that's not as nicely defined as this so you got your bone rotation wrong then these the bones will be lying in the wrong direction you can change all that with the bone editor tool but uh, the most important thing now is that i think and i think there's also a bug in that studio if i go back to my universal manipulator tool select the top bit of my of my object i can now go and bend it notice the obvious issue here is that while I'm moving the manipulator, this thing doesn't want to, doesn't bend. It snaps into place the moment I, I let go of my left click. And so it does that, but it doesn't seem to do this while I'm, while I'm moving it. And that's, that's kind of bizarre. And I've tracked this down. I thought I was mad at first, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I, it's not actually me being mad. It's a bug in Das Studio. So I'll go and save this as cylinder version four. All right, and I'll go and literally just uh, close that studio down <laughs> and then I'll try again. I don't really know why it happens, but if I bring it back, if I go and, and uh, restart that studio now, it'll it'll bend no problem. I just don't know what that bug is. Uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe there's a magic tick box I've forgotten, but <laughs> the bug in that studio must be mistaken. So uh, recent cylinder V4. So same thing again. I, I select the top bit here and bends. And it answers on a postcard. I don't. I don't know why. I don't know why that happens. But this is our object rigged, and I'm thinking that's just that's just seriously cool. It's a feature alter. That's exactly what it is. It's a feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature. This is what what is, what do what people call that again? It is expected behavior. That is what it's called. So yes, now we can go and animate this guy uh, into any axis. But there's also this issue that uh, the geometry, depending on how much I bend it, the geometry kind of collapses here. So it doesn't bend nicely. It just goes and breaks the geometry. And usually that's something you fix with a clever combination of locking rotations so locking rotational values so that certain things that break your object you just make sure the user can't do it that's that's one way of doing it but the other way that we can that we can employ is the weight maps thing so let's go to go back to the weight maps tool and let's work on the x rotational map so i'll go and select that this this is difficult let me go and go through this one more time because this is something that i had great difficulties with with maps and where are they what what are they what what how do they look and so with the may with, with hasm with the <laughs> node weight brush tool selected you can select one portion of your object so bottom middle or top we're using the top so select that first then think about what map you'd like to fix so remember we have three maps we have the x and the y and the z rotational maps if i had enabled all properties when I created the maps in the figure setup tab, I'd also have the scale maps and I had three bulge maps. So there'll be a lot more maps here. So I need, I'm gonna work on the X rotation. That's the value that gets adjusted with the, with the red piece here. So this is the, the map I'm fixing. If I'm bending this thing into another direction, say the Z rotation, then my fix isn't going to show up. So that's something to remember. We're going to go and fix the X rotation or the, the, the bulge here, this, this bit where my geometry collapses. And you can paint on this weight map, on this X rotation weight map, uh, or you can go and do something similar to the geometry selection that we had there and just go and smooth this whole thing out. And I think that's what I'm going to do. Smoothing means, yeah, wiggle, exactly. Smoothing means that wherever the map ends, like at the bottom, that's where we put a gradient. So rather than having an abrupt line, we're going to just smooth that out. And to do that, I believe, let's go and select the whole first part here. And you can, you can once again, you can either go and use the geometry editor to go and, and select that, or you can go and just select the whole uh, top bit here. Oops, deselect everything. Clear selection. You can go and just go and uh, hit plus here. Then the whole top is selected. There's another way to do that. I'll show you that too. Uh, go back to node weight map thing. With this selection now, you can right click and say weight editing smooth selected. 
And so once again, smoothing means that wherever the map is painted, that 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 bottom bit just gets smoothed out. So let's go and hit that. Uh, you can enter a factor, 50%. I might enter something like 20 here in iterations. If you leave that on the default one, it'll do very little. So if you do, if you crank that up, then you can really see that things change. And not only does the color change, but also the behavior of it changes. It's difficult to see with the selection in place. Let me go and uh, geometry selection clear all. You can see that my colors have changed now. So the bottom bit is bluish now. The top bit isn't quite as red anymore as it was a moment ago. And the more you adjust these maps, the behavior, the way the bones will influence the geometry that is being moved is going to change. So if I would like for there to be less influence here, I can go and paint this out. I can either do that or I can go and uh, smooth just a... Whoops. What am I doing there? That's uncool. What was that? That's not what I wanted to do. This is because I'm painting. My, my modifiers aren't quite set up as good as they could be. If I'm just thinking, maybe I'll just smooth this bit out. I think I can do that. Geometry, weight editing, smooth selected. So just those. Gets even smoother here. Clear selection. So uh, yeah, that's that's how to that's how to that's how to do that. You can really go to town with painting those maps, but remember you have to paint every single map. So you this while the X map is now fixed in this direction or thereabouts. It behaves slightly different in that direction because I haven't smoothed these faces out. But also notice that if I go and bring this kind of back to zero here, if I move it into the X direction, that is a different map. So I have to go and apply my fix again to a different map if I wanted for this to behave the same way. So this is now a different map. If I change to that, you can see that it's still completely red. So I'd have to go and fix that as well. Kind of interesting, isn't it? That is how that works. Let's, in fact, while we're here, let's fix that as well. So uh, this is probably what artists spent a ton of time with. <laughs> Let me go and select my, my whole surface from here as well. So that's under geometry selection. And then I can go and say select by, check it out, face groups. So I can select the whole top from here. I don't have to switch back to the geometry editor. <laughs> Weight mapping, Michael, how you doing? No problem. So select the whole top and then we go and do exactly the same thing that we did before. We go into uh, weight editing, smooth selected, ding. And now my X rotation map is also saved. Kind of cool, huh? So with these two things on the top part fixed, let's go fix the middle part. So that now <laughs> requires us to go to the middle, which has the same thing. We're going to fix the Z rotation first. Let's go and select once again, select by face groups middle ding and ah actually this is the top part is still selected so let's deselect that so clear selection now let's select the top the, the middle part selection select by face groups middle there we go and we're gonna go weight editing smooth selected same again in the z rotation but also in the x rotation where it's still completely red so i'm gonna have to do this there as well and this took me literally forever to to get the concept of bones weight maps weight maps associated with rotational axes as well as portions in your object that you want to that you want to fix so brain you know Let's fix that as well. And while we're here, oh, let's go test it, in fact. Middle part now also bends smoother than it did before. I can literally build a slinky and then animate him. I'd like that. I'd like that. And then we can go do that as well. Also fairly smooth, but the bottom is still not fixed. So let's go fix the bottom next. So once again, select the bottom part of your object then go to the weight map tool, make sure the selection is cleared, clear selection, then right click and well, first of all, this is the bottom, isn't it? This is, bottom is that, that was the top selected there. So let's select the bottom face by uh, geometry selection, select by face groups bottom, 
Now, geometry, weight editing, rather, smooth selected. And this is on the X rotation now. That's done, now let's fix the Z rotation. Editing, smooth selected. Boom. So now that's also smoothed out. Kind of interesting. Let me go and deselect everything. And since there's also now a twist, we should also fix the Y rotation map while we're here. Shall we do that? Should we fix Y rotation as well to make it really smooth? Yeah, let's do that. Why not? While we're here. Start with the bottom. Once again. Dang you. Geometry selection. Select by face groups. But we learn by repetition, which is what I find quite exciting. So we just go and do this over and over again and eventually... Eventually it'll grow on you. There we go. So now the polygons are less... Uh, less... Um, influence less as I twist my thing around the y-axis. And let's go and do this on the middle as well. So we're fixing the Y rotational maps now. So clear selection. You can also set yourself up a shortcut for that. Uh, select by face group middle. Y rotation. Editing smooth selected. We haven't twisted it yet, so we're not going to see that big a difference. And now the top. Clear selection. Geometry selection. Select by face groups top, smooth, and we're nearly done. Uh, smooth. There we go. Well, perfect. And now I can go and bend my slinky with my regular, with my regular tool here. I think I might also give slinky a little color. I, I did like seeing him in all kinds of other different colors. So maybe, uh, uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe orange. Is that good? Yeah. There we go. Slinky's got a slinky's got an orange color. Now that's cool. So I can go and move any of these parts of my object and they all look fairly handsome and I can go the I can go another way if I wanted to have this guy look even better then I can add a smoothing modifier let me go and close the figure setup tab now so I can go and move this out of the way a bit yeah so now I can go and and apply the usual smoothing bits and pieces if I wanted to do that. So with my with my whole top object selected, I can go under edit. And this is what the figure setup tab also offers to do by, um, by default. Uh, just apply a subdivision surface modifier to it. That'll just make this thing all look just like a, you know, like a, like a worm. And it bends even better because there's more geometry now. Is that cool or what? It's kind of, kind of interesting, isn't it? how this works. I mean, there's so many other tools that you can align your bones with, uh, with the shape of the figure and, uh, and in, in real life models, you're going to have to do a lot more adjustment. But yeah, that's, that's basically rigging in, in principle. It's kind of cool, isn't it? And I've just found that out. I thought I'll share it with you. Duct tape. Exactly. Let's do that. Man, exactly, Chris. So this is this is crazy because on top of that, there's also like what Chris was saying. There's also these things called joint control morphs. So if we if we take the top bit, uh, for example, and currently I can actually let me just go and, and reset this guy into its um, default position here, like you know, like so. That and middle. I've played around with it so much. There, you know, let's go and let's go and do that. If I go, so this is what Chris was saying. If I go and turn this currently, <clears throat> come on, turn this. Then currently, the only thing that happens is that the the top bit turns. But imagine this is an arm on a figure, and not only do I do I take this uh, this elbow joint and bring it up. Maybe at the same time, I'd like my bicep to come out. That is also possible, and that is called a joint control morph. That's technically a property you set up on a joint that says when this gets bent and into what degree, then also dial up morph X, Y, Z to a certain degree. So that's what a joint control morph does. And it's uh, it's fascinating to think about it because there's so much work that's been going into the uh, into the Genesis figure, and this is how they've done it. Music stopped. Uncool. Jonah Ardaker. We want to hear more from you. Yeah, so 
Um, as soon as I find out more about that, Patrick, you'll be the first to know. There's also, speaking of joint control morphs, there's one other thing that's called a morph controlled morph. And that is something very similar, but it doesn't take its cue from a movable joint. It takes its cue from a morph. So say I dial in an eye close morph, for example, then that morph would control left eye close and right eye close. So that's a morph controlled morph, an MCM. The JCM uh, looks at uh, literally what joint is being bent into what position and then adds another morph. Biscuits, thank you so much for the super chat donation. Wonderful to see you. We're just talking about rigging and the basics thereof, and we just made this little slinky guy. It's super exciting, so I can bend him now, and he can, he can, you know, it's. There's so much more we can do, of course, but uh, these are the concepts and principles that I greatly struggled with, and I hope you can, you can take something from this away. Very cool. You make exciting shapes with this guy. Very nice. Imagine we animate him that he walks around. I think I might make a slinky with five segments and then have him walk around. Maybe just put the put a couple of eyes on there. That might be an idea. <laughs> So um, that's uh, the basic rigging. Do you know, I think that is all I have for today. I think I think that's it. Is there anything else we want to talk about? Let me just go quickly go through the chat. If, if there's probably something that I've missed, I do apologize. If there's any other burning questions you'd like to ask, do let me know. I'm just <laughs> I'm just seeing Patrick's comment about uh, about a transport transport game I don't recall that I do approve of the of the coffee sound effect so and yes one max Matora I do agree why didn't they make one united standard format for 3d uh, for exchanging 3d things well th there is something like that is in the work so FBX was always proprietary so that was always governed by whatever Autodesk feels like should be in there so that's one of those things FBX isn't it Collada and Alembic were two of those attempts at making that happen but as things evolved there had to be more and more information that these formats just couldn't take on uh, so the latest one is something called usd i think it's the universal 3d standard i believe that's a file format that's being implemented in blender right now they're working on that and many industry leaders have agreed that that's the new way of working so usd if you ever come across that it's something that will hopefully let us transfer materials as well as rigging as well as animation as well as geometry in one file format that's hopefully interchangeable from one app into another but we're not quite there yet. but that's in the works that's certainly in the works Patrick, thank you so much. I like it. I like it. Liking the cool stickers. <laughs> JCMs, I don't know enough about JCMs to explain them at the moment, I'm afraid, Hectics. Uh, but as soon as I will, as, as soon as I do, I will totally let you know. That and MCMs. I've experimented with MCMs. I've experimented with key properties. They're all along the same lines. And as soon as I have a better understanding of, uh, of how that works, I'll totally tell you. Definitely. It was transporting something in a game. I don't recall. I don't recall. Transporting. What were we transporting? It wasn't Subnautica, was it? What were we transporting? It wasn't Raft either, was it? What were we transporting? I've, I've played a really cool game. I might share that with you. Uh, called Automa Chef. It's currently free on Amazon Games. Man, that is cool. You're building an automatic kitchen and it's like writing code so you have a robot that wants to take over the world and he has little kitchen appliances like you know meat dispenser and then meat needs to go in a food processor that needs to then go on a grill and you have to have robotic arms that take it out there to feed the humans that's crazy stuff it's, it's a very good game automa chef yes 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 absolutely i'll, I'll make a note of that hectic's no problem <laughs> 
Okay, guys, I think I'm going to leave you to it and have uh, say have a wonderful weekend. I will be back tomorrow playing a little bit of Subnautica, which is awesome. We're going to see the end game, which is very, very exciting. So Subnautica Below Zero, we're going to finish that tomorrow. Join me for that at 10 a.m. in the morning, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is about 6 in the, uh, in the evening in Europe, 5 in the UK, and it'll be sometime very late in the evening in Australia and New Zealand. Have a wonderful weekend my friends and i'll see you hopefully tomorrow otherwise uh soon hopefully soon uh titles take care bye bye